Don't give me applause. You guys have not heard the message yet. <laughs> but all glory to God in reality. And what Pastor Ryan said, it's not just about giving somebody else the opportunity to, to preach, but even more so giving our leader that the Lord has given us an opportunity to take a, take a breath and get other things done as well. To preach a message 10 weeks in a row is a lot of pressure, a lot of on his plate. So I'm happy to play a part in him getting a little bit of a rest, but you guys get the, you guys get the backup QB for the day, I guess. So I pray that the message still speaks to you. So we're going to start, we're going to open back up to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to begin in verse, in verse 1, which defines faith as we're walking through this hall of faith section in Hebrews 11. Verse 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Where you put your hope, what your hope is in, is exactly where you're going to end up putting your faith Pastor Ryan just finished talking about Abraham and us learning about the faith of Abraham from that faith is obedient when it's difficult. We learn faith is obedient and that the Lord is Jehovah Jireh and he always provided and he still always provides. Abraham didn't know how the Lord would provide as he took that multi-day hike up the mountain. He just knew he had to put his faith in the Lord. So we're gonna begin in verse 23 as if you want to turn to Hebrews eleven twenty three, 23. And I have a quick shepherd's rant, pastor's rant, that uh, last, I think it was Thursday, I was watching a sermon on YouTube and I was like, oh, I don't know what this guy is saying. I went to check out the ministry, went to the website and this box pops up and it says, subscribe and give a gift and we'll send you a, a free, or well, after you give us a gift, we'll send you your own personal prophecy. And I was like... X. The reality is, I, I believe in prophecy. I believe that the Lord still speaks in all those ways. I believe in all the spiritual gifts still being used because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's, those things have not been cut off. But don't ever pay for something for somebody to minister to you. Don't pay for a prophecy for somebody to give you a word to speak into your life or anything like that. The closest thing we saw that in scripture was when they were paying for salvation in the temple and Jesus went in the temple and cleared it out. So don't, don't ever fall into that type of misleading and trap. Just trying to shepherd you guys in the, in the correct direction. The best way you ever want to hear God speak, the best way to do that is to open up his word and he's already spoken to us. Amen. So let's begin in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses hid, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict or Pharaoh's edict. There's gonna be this common thread as we look at Moses' story that these things that you think were done out of fear were actually done out of faith. The king's edict to kill all the Hebrew babies, you think, oh, well, they're hiding him from Pharaoh's police and Pharaoh's army and whatnot. Well, it actually says they were not afraid of the king's edict. They hid him, but it wasn't out of fear. It was out of obedience and out of faith to what God had told them to do. By faith, Moses' parents hid him. By faith, they put him in the basket in the Nile River. By faith, he grew up to go back to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to say, let my people go. And by faith, he parted the Red Sea so that Israel would escape. Spoiler alert, in case you don't know the story yet. But notice where Mo Moses' faith begins. Verse 23 said, by faith, Moses' parents hid him. Where's my parents, mothers, fathers, grandparents, guardians of all kinds in the room? Where are you guys at? Are you proud? You can raise your hand. Your, the reality is your faith doesn't save your children's, doesn't save your children's faith, but your faith has a large impact on their faith. If it wasn't for my mom bringing me to this church when I was a young child, I wouldn't have been raised in the church. I wouldn't have been raised hearing all the good things from Pastor John over there in children's church and 
And growing up here, hearing all these messages, countless messages from Pastor Kuhn and Pastor Ryan preaching to me my entire life over at youth group, if I was not brought here as a child, I wouldn't have been raised in the faith. If it wasn't for my grandma telling me when I was seven or eight years old, I remember her saying that even though she lives far away, that she prays for me every day, which gave me the ability to withstand the trials and tribulations of the world. Your faith doesn't save your children, but your faith has a huge influence and impact on your children. So be obedient and continue to keep the faith and doing what you know you should be doing to grow them up and train them up in the way they should go. Amen? Let's look at this story a little deeper in Exodus chapter two. We're gonna start actually in chapter one, the last verse of chapter one, verse 22, and flow into chapter two. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it in tar and pitch. When she placed a child in it, then she placed a child in it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking, walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. The first point is that faith puts trust in God. Faith trusts God when it gets hard. Faith trusts God when, it's, when things are difficult. And faith puts its trust in God when the enemy is closing down around you. Like it was with Pharaoh's guard and Pharaoh's people coming around door to door in the Israelite camps looking for Hebrew babies. I couldn't imagine how much faith Abraham had to have to take Isaac up the mountain, but he had to keep faith that the Lord would provide. I can't imagine, I'm not a parent, how hard it was for Moses' mom to put him in a basket as an infant and leave him in a river, knowing, putting all her faith in the Lord, not knowing how things were gonna work out, but knowing that God is forever faithful. Sometimes, faith, faith is always obedience, but sometimes faith is letting go of the things that we hold on to way too tightly. It wasn't wrong for her to want to be protective of her child, but when the Lord said to let him work, she had to have the faith to let go to the things that she loved most dear. And remember what Pharaoh said about the babies, about the baby boys, that they should be thrown into the river, but yet the exact Nile River that was meant to destroy and kill Moses now played a part in his protection. Moses was now protected by the kings, by, by Pharaoh's guard and Pharaoh's palace. And we'll see that further as we continue to read. In verse seven, then his sister, this is Moses' sister, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? We know that later on the, the Bible mentions Moses' sister, his name, her name is Miriam, and she's one of seven female prophets named in the Old Testament. And Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby, nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, for I drew him out of water. Now, this situation is not ideal. It's not perfect. It's terrible. It's not good in any way. But out of a really terrible situation, the Lord provided and protected Moses. And the family, albeit for a short period of time, got a really sweet deal out of the situation. Moses' family got to raise him and get paid by Pharaoh's house to raise their own son. 
Many Hebrew scholars actually believe this wasn't just Moses as an infant, but this took place over a period of time of Moses' childhood, probably till about the age of nine or up to 12 years old. Moses gets this protection. The the Pharaoh's guard can't come to Moses' family's house anymore and looking for the baby crying. They knew if that baby was crying, there's nothing they could do about it. That was Pharaoh's daughter's adopted son. So they receive financial provision from Pharaoh's house that tried to kill Moses and protection from Pharaoh's house. Here's my second point. Faith is knowing who you are in Christ. When you hold on to who you really are in Christ, people can't sway you from it. Your faith is built on the rocks. I love how Haiti was sharing with that that exact same message during worship. When your faith is built on the rocks, the things of the world can't sway you from it. Let's keep that point in mind as we continue to read in Hebrews 24. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's edict. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Moses had his eyes on heaven, so much so that he knew that he would even be looked down upon or persecuted, and it says, regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Something Moses understood and we need to be reminded of today. This is one of the reasons why they thought he might have been raised as a child, some of his childhood among the Israelite people, because he had something to hold on to when he went back to, the, to Pharaoh's palace and to be raised by Pharaoh's daughter, that he wasn't just handed over as an infant, but as he grew up as a child, that he, was, he had the ways of God, the ways of Yahweh and the great I am instilled in him through the stories of his people, that when he went, he knew what his true identity was when he went into the world, when he went in into Pharaoh's palace, he knew who he truly was. Even though they tried to give him the title of prince and they tried to give him all the things, he knew who he was. Here's the third point. Faith refuses the fleeting pleasures of sin. This can be very difficult for most most of us, but imagine as a prince, imagine as a royal family member having access to anything that Moses' heart desired. Anything he wanted in culture or society was his. Growing up as Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter's son, this would have been his access to anything and anyone he wanted. How often in mainstream society in Hollywood do we see similar stories of somebody who's becoming famous or new, newly famous and they share their upbringing at home and maybe that they were raised going to church and they claim to be Christian and then after a few years of fame and fortune, they're making decisions that don't line up with the original things they said of being a person of faith. And I don't think that that means that the things they were said before when they were first famous was a lie. I don't think that's the case. I think that the weight and the pressure and the fame and fortune weighed on them so much that they ended up falling into the fleeting pleasures of sin. This would have been Moses' pressure times a thousand, being a prince in Egypt's society. But he held on. He had his eyes on heaven. It says he kept his eyes on the reward of eternal life. He had his eyes on heaven first, and that way he could see that everything else in the world was fleeting. Let's continue reading in Hebrews, back to Hebrews 11, verse 28. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. So this is the 10th plague in 
the story where Moses goes back to Pharaoh after he's been a shepherd in, the, in Midian for 40 years in the wilderness. He goes back to the palace to Egypt and he calls down these 10 plagues upon Egypt. And we know this is when he tells Pharaoh to let my people go. And we often think of strong, bold, confident Moses, but that's not actually how the Bible says the story goes. Just a funny point so we can paint the, the story correctly when you have it in your mind that Moses talking to God in the burning bush and God says to go back to Egypt and Moses says, I don't speak well and God tells him to go and Moses denies the assignment three times. And like, Lord, I don't wanna go. He says, would you consider another servant? Would you consider somebody else? And the Lord says, your brother Aaron is on the way to you right now. I'm gonna speak to you, you speak to Aaron, Aaron speaks to Pharaoh. So it wasn't Moses speaking confidently in, in Pharaoh's court saying, let my people go, Pharaoh. They showed up to Pharaoh's throne and Moses said, let my people go. And Aaron went, let my people go. It was, he wasn't as we initially think that he was, but he was obedient to what God told him to do, even if God had to make some ways around for it to actually go down. He was obedient. Another maybe picture of Moses that we don't see completely correctly is, is what he, where he was in his life when he went back to Pharaoh. Where's my young at heart, wise in age, people in the room, my, my elders, proud, proud elders. You, you've been serving the Lord faithfully for years, right? Moses was not this young prince of Egypt when he went back to Pharaoh. Moses was 80 years old when he went back to Pharaoh. He was 120 years old when he died and he led the people in the wilderness for 40 years after they escaped Egypt. So this point when they're escaping Egypt and the, the plagues and the Red Sea, he was 80 years old. If you're in the golden age of your life, <laughs> let me tell you, your most significant story and impact on the kingdom of God might not even started yet. Don't count yourself out. Don't just think you need to cruise into heaven. The, the most popular part of Moses' story that we know and we read was in the last third of his life. So don't count yourself out thinking, well, the Lord's done with me because I don't run as fast as I used to run. All right? The Lord still needs to use you. And I can tell you, leading the youth and the young adults here, we need the elders of the church to be with us and pray with us and pray for us. Let's continue in Exodus 11, reading about this last plague. Exodus 11, verses four through seven. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. They will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been before or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. They will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And I love that last portion that he makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. God always protects his people from his judgment falling from Noah and he protected the righteous from the flood to Sodom and Gomorrah and protecting Lot and his family to here making a distinction between Egypt and Israel as his judgment was about to fall on Egypt. You can remember not too long ago, Pastor Ryan did this series called Holding On to Truth, which explored the reliability of scripture, us understanding that scripture is accurate and his, historically truthful. When you have conversation with people that say, why do you put so much faith in this 2,000 plus year old book? And they want you to prove it. Here's an example of, of how so. There's an ancient Egyptian book called the Pure Papyrus Laden. I want to read to you an excerpt from 
the pure papyrus. It's written by ancient Egyptian historians, and this is what is written on page 152. Groaning is throughout the land, mingled with laments. Lo, many dead are buried in the river. The stream is a grave. The tomb became a stream, and he who puts his brother in the ground is everywhere. What kind of calamity could cause everybody everywhere is burying their brother? That the river has become like a grave. You could say a natural disaster. I see the Egyptians reading about, writing about this giant calamity, and I'm going to say it sounds exactly like the firstborn son of every f- family in Egypt having their firstborn son pass away, that everybody is burying their brother. I think it's one of two events. It's either that, or it's as described when Pharaoh said for the Hebrew babies to be thrown into the Nile. I want to say, low many are dead and buried in the river, just as Pharaoh's edict declared. It's either one of those two events. I think it's the, I think it's that it was the firstborn sons of Egypt and them having to bury all their firstborn sons of Egypt because why would the Egyptians, it's very unlikely that they would have recorded a genocide of their slaves, but they will record the massive passing away of all their firstborn sons. And let's continue reading in verse 29, just as we learn that even, it's it's amazing how even secular and worldly historical recordings prove that the Bible is true. In verse 21, 29, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as though on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Hebrews 11, the story of Moses in this part ends with his most famous, the climax of his life that we know of, the biggest miracle of passing through the Red Sea. And to close this message, as they escaped into freedom, to close, I want to draw a few parallels between the faith of Moses in Hebrews 11 and Exodus to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the beginning of Pharaoh's edict to kill the baby boys just as King Herod had the rule to kill all of the Israelite babies under two, trying to kill Jesus. Moses was a shepherd in Midian for 40 years. Jesus, as we read in Mark 6.34, was the good shepherd. Jesus saw a huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things as a good shepherd would, teaching the people about the ways that they should go, about the kingdom of heaven. Moses brought the law of God to the people of Israel. There was no recorded writings before Moses. He brought the law to the nation of Israel. They called it the Mosaic law because he delivered it to them from God, but it's God's law. Jesus fulfilled the law in Matthew 5.17. He said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. What does that mean? How did Jesus fulfill the law? The Israelites in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, their holiness and their righteousness and their salvation was measured by how they measured up to the law, how they compared to the rules and the regulations and Moses' law. That's how their holiness was measured. Our salvation and our holiness is found fully in Christ. It's not measuring up to Christ. It's not measuring up to the law. It's in Christ. He fulfilled the law. So all we have to do is put our faith and our hope in Jesus, and we have salvation and eternal life and relationship with the Heavenly Father. Moses delivered Israel from bondage in Egypt, from the slavery of Egypt. Jesus did not deliver Israel from Roman oppression, but he did deliver all of us, Jew, Gentile, all humanity, from the oppression and the slavery of sin and death. Amen. Worship team, you can come on up.
I asked the worship team to close with the first song they started today, This Is Our God. I pray the message today builds your faith. If you're ready to put faith in Jesus, there'll be prayer team members up here at the altar during the song and after the song. If you need prayer for anything, they'll be up here as well. I want to close with a short story in Exodus 17. It says this, and in the song they, they're, they're singing actually refers to it. I didn't realize it until the second service. There's the lyrics. Now see the altars in the wilderness. They tell the story of his faithfulness. In Exodus 17, Moses has to keep his arms up while the Israelites fight the Amalekites. And when his arms grow weak, the Israelites begin to lose. As long as he keeps his arms up, they win. And what a beautiful picture of discipleship and praying for one another and building each other's faith up. Because as his arms grow weak, other men of God come alongside of Moses and hold his arms up when he can't do it anymore so that he can continue to be obedient to the call that God gave him. So if your faith feels like Moses' arms in that moment, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. That's what the church is here for. If, you're, if your faith is, feels weak over the past few moments of your life or the, over the past few weeks or months, come forward, allow people to pray with you. Allow the church to lift your faith up, lift your arms up. And then we see the altar built after they win the victory. It says that Moses built an altar at that point after they beat the Amalekites, and he said, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner and our protector. As we worship, I pray that you would remember the words of Moses in that moment, that the Lord is our banner and our protector, that he is forever faithful, that he won't leave you or forsake you. Would you stand as we close in prayer and, and lean into worship? Lord God, you are everything that we need. I pray that we would put our faith in you when times get hard and difficult, that we would put our faith in you and people would come around us when our arms grow weak and we need people to raise up our own faith and keep us going in the right direction and keep our eyes pointing towards heaven so the things of the world aren't enticing. I pray that you, you would strengthen your people's faith in the room so that they would see the things of the world are fleeting pleasures and they don't have any eternal value. I pray that you would strengthen the parents and the guardians and the grandparents in the room, just like Moses' family, to help these parents raising the next generation, discipling their kids, to give them stronger faith and obedience so that they would raise world changers, kingdom changers for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.